tune into any random live stream involving a Falcon 9 rocket, odds are good at liftoff you'll hear something like this. Engines full power and liftoff. Go Falcon, go Starlink. Starlink, of course, is the name of SpaceX's satellites designed to connect regular folks, companies, and governments to the internet. They operate in low Earth orbit between 540 and 570 kilometers in altitude. That's about 336 to 354 miles. And in the past five years, they have handily become the most flown satellite in the world. They make up more than 60% of all the satellites in orbit. And on Sunday, October 19th, Engines full power and liftoff. From 1010 to 10,000, go Starlink, go Falcon, go SpaceX. SpaceX launched its 10,000th Starlink satellite to date. Vehicle is pitching downrange. It's truly remarkable when uh, SpaceX came along in, in 2019 and went, yeah, okay, we're launching this system and we're going to launch like 30,000 satellites. It, it just seemed ludicrous. It was so far beyond what any organization had done previously. And uh, and so the fact that they have been able to maintain that launch cadence and to successfully operate that many satellites in low Earth orbit, right? Uh, and that's really in itself a huge advance in the technology. That reaction was pretty similar for a lot of folks. Before it was known publicly as Starlink, the concept for this LEO constellation was introduced by SpaceX founder Elon Musk at a private event in 2015. In a video published by a YouTube account named Cliff O, Musk said SpaceX would have an operational fleet in five years. So the focus is going to be on creating a global communication system. Uh, this would be, this is quite an ambitious effort. So it's really talking about something which is, uh, it's, in the long term, it would be like rebuilding the internet in space. Um, and uh, the goal will be to uh, have a majority of long distance internet traffic go over this network, and about 10% of local consumer and business traffic. Fast forward to February 2018. The first prototypes called Tintin A and Tintin B launched as rideshare payloads from what was then Vandenberg Air Force Base. And as we mentioned earlier, there are two SpaceX test satellites flying as secondary payloads on this mission. Uh, these are meant to gather data in advance of deploying and operating a satellite constellation that will provide internet service. Then on May 23, 2019, the first batch of 60 production Starlink satellites launched from Florida and we have confirmation of deploy. Deploying a little more than an hour after liftoff. Since then, there have been hundreds of Starlink launches deploying thousands of satellites. All of that leading to the Starlink Group 11-19 mission, during which SpaceX launched its 10,000th Starlink satellite. It's something that no other satellite operator has come even close to approaching to date. So, we asked Quilty Space's Director of Research, Caleb Henry, how SpaceX pulled it off. It's a good question, and there's not a short answer for it. So I'll try to break this down through what I would say are five major lenses. Four of them are technological, one of them financial. Uh, financial first, Starlink has been able to raise, or SpaceX has been able to raise significant sums of money. Uh, they easily raised more than any other constellation venture that wasn't either internally funded like Amazon or government funded like the SDA or perhaps some Chinese constellations. So having access to billions of dollars in capital really helped. The money alone is not the, the solution. It's not the reason that they were able to do this and others hadn't by itself. The four technological lenses concern SpaceX's vertical integration of launch, satellites, gateways, and user terminals. Henry says cracking the code on the user terminals was critical. When SpaceX got started with this, they acknowledged, hey, these are costing us, it was like three to $4,000 a piece, and they were subsidizing that cost so that consumers could purchase it. This is, again, where raising tons of money helps because you can subsidize it until you get that flywheel in motion. And uh, in a over the course of five, six years, they went from 
producing a few hundred a year or a few hundred a week to a thousand a week to 15,000 a week to as of this year, 75,000 user terminals Monday through Friday. And to put that into perspective, the rest of the industry historically would get excited if maybe they got one order for like a thousand satellite a thousand satellite terminals uh, i think your next closest uh, out there would be the utilsat one web constellation where they'll place orders for five to ten thousand user terminals at a time and that's a lot for the rest of the industry but starlink is building just an order of magnitude you know maybe two orders of magnitude above what anyone else is doing and that allows them to reach a price point for their equipment that is so low that uh, they basically made the consumer market explode and their subscribers are over 7 million now we anticipate them ending 2025 with around 8 to 8.2 million consumer subscribers you know that's more than the next biggest players use in Viasat combined i think together those guys have about 1 million, maybe 1.2 or 1.3 million today. Uh, it's just by far and away, they're the most competitive consumer system out there. And they've reached a speed and a, and a level of momentum that now is, is quite hard to catch up to. As of publishing this video, SpaceX has more than 8,600 satellites in low Earth orbit. That's according to stats maintained by X-ray astronomer, astrophysicist, and expert orbital tracker, Jonathan McDowell. Of course, SpaceX is far from being the only player in the low Earth orbit constellation sandbox. McDowell says as LEO becomes more congested, it will be trickier for satellite operators to function safely. I think we're already seeing signs of strain in the Space Force tracking system. And remember that SpaceX's method of doing this collision avoidance for, for non-SpaceX satellites um, is to upload the Space Force's uh, satellite catalog and use that to figure out. So it's only as reliable as the Space Force's catalog. And as we're seeing more and more um, uh, like lack of being up to date and missing objects in, in that catalog, um, you worry that that's going to start impacting the safety level for, for, for the Constellation. As the public saw during SpaceX's broadcast of the Starship Flight 11 mission, the version 3 iteration of the Starlink satellites that will begin launching on Starship are significantly larger than the V2 minis flying today. And with size comes a large increase in capacity for these satellites, both the broadband and the direct-to-cell versions. SpaceX says that each launch of a batch of its V3 satellites will add 60 terabits per second of capacity to its network. That scale of growth is part of what allowed Quilty Space to project a total revenue for Starlink to be nearly $11 billion for fiscal year 2025 and approaching $16 billion by the end of fiscal year 26. Our expectation is eight Starship launches dedicated to the Starlink constellation in 2026, split with one to two in the first half of the year, uh, followed by a pause. This is common when introducing a new generation of satellites uh, for any operator. If you take a pause, you figure out uh, how your new technology is working, and, and then you can shift into a more rapid function. So one or two in the first half of the year, followed by another half dozen in the back half. Uh, this, of course, is a bit speculative. Uh, there's a lot that could change. Any launch failures or anomalies could upset that schedule. But the V3 version of Starship is supposed to be able to lift 100 metric tons to orbit. And we see that as really unlocking the V3 version of the satellite, which is going to be heavier, which is going to have a terabit of capacity, which is by far and away more than you know, any other low Earth orbit satellite out there. McDowell says one of the effects that he and others will be watching closely will be the impact of these massive satellites once they start re-entering the atmosphere at the end of their operating lives. Um, one of the things, of course, that we're tracking is as you know, five years after you see this increase in launches, 
you see a corresponding increase in re-entries. And there's been a lot of attention lately to the fact that we're seeing, you know, for a while earlier this year, we were seeing four or five Starlink re-entries a day as they retired the first constellation. Now it's back down to one or two a day. But in a 30,000 satellite constellation, it's going to be 15 re-entries a day of these one to two ton satellites and we're still running the calculations but it, it is a bit of a concern as to what that's going to do to the chemistry of the upper atmosphere the mesosphere is kind of fragile there's not a lot of it uh, and we're already exceeding the amount of aluminium coming in from you know used to be used to be the saying is Yeah, you get so much more stuff from natural meteors that it clearly isn't anything to worry about. That's no longer true. And, and so we really have to start looking at what the effect is on that, both from the input of metals from the melting satellites and the shock waves of the re-entering satellites that compress the atmosphere and cause atmospheric chemistry to happen uh, uh, in that sort of secondary effect way. This is so much more a bigger effect on near-Earth space than humanity has done in the past, that there may be other things that we haven't thought of yet that we're missing that are going to have an impact. There are also questions about the impact the growing satellite constellation will have for radio astronomers around the world. SpaceX has previously said it's working with the community through organizations like the National Science Foundation and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory to mitigate its impacts. However, despite these efforts, McDowell says it's still a bit problematic. From what I understand from my colleagues and the papers I've seen, we're seeing these you know, unintended out of band radio emissions from Starlinks that when, when the low frequency radio telescopes make maps of the sky, they're dotted with these, these uh, big splodges from, from Starlink satellites that they're really uh, starting to be a big issue. Uh, and so, I, I, and, and uh, this is a, a wave band that is critical for studying the early universe we're looking for at different redshifts and so at different frequencies you you see the effect of the hydrogen in the early universe what we call recombinings of becoming making the universe uh, uh, transparent after the big bang um, it's a critical factor in understanding how the first galaxies formed and if if we're having to fight our way through all of this radio interference to see it, that's going to be unfortunate. But with SpaceX showing no signs of slowing with the development and deployment of its Starlink constellation, and with so many unknowns, it's difficult to say, now six years in, how the future will unfold over the next half decade with tens of thousands more Starlinks to come. To me, one of the most interesting things about Starlink is actually how hard it is to predict what it's going to be or what it's going to do. <laughs> when this constellation was just getting started, it was a much smaller 4,400 satellites was the original filing. The altitude was around 1,100 kilometers, um, fairly similar to what we see from like a one web or a telesat light speed. They radically lowered that orbit. The constellation size is now projected to be 10 times that original filing. And they keep iterating on the generations of the satellite, of the gateway, of the user terminal. Yeah, you know, the Block 5 is supposed to be frozen, but I think we've seen some evolution of what SpaceX can do with the Falcon 9 over the years. They're relentlessly good at, at tinkering with and changing and optimizing their technology. And SpaceX has an approach of wanting to be the party that disrupts itself, not waiting for someone else to come along and build a better satellite or build a better rocket. You know, they're the ones that take their own tech and render it obsolete. So five, 10 years from now, what will Starlink look like? I don't have a clue. <laughs> um, but I think that whatever they have in five or 10 years time, 
is something that's going to make today's version of Starlink look archaic. And that's what's exciting about it. Reporting for Spaceflight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.